And he, I call him D3 because he's my third dad. And um, he, he saw what I was preaching on today. And any time that your father tells you you might have include something, and he's 90 years old, and he was on the Ethiopian mission field for decades, I've learned to pay attention to that. So I'm going to use this as a way to introduce this message today. These are some scriptural thoughts from the, the Old Testament or the first part of the, the Jewish Old Testament scriptures, and part of the fulfillment of what we see in the new is in this wisdom in the old. These are all from the book of Proverbs. If you're ever wondering what kind of read that will help me, you can go immediately to the book of Proverbs in the Bible, and it will immediately help you with wisdom. The first one is this, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. Commit whatever it is to Him, and your plans will succeed. If you can't commit them to Him, your plans won't succeed. Secondly, Proverbs 16, verse 9. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Our lives are rarely this. They're more like this. And the more we pay attention to God and keep Him as our true north, Everything changes and gets better in our lives. And third, Proverbs 19, verse 21. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So that's from my dad, number three. And it's wisdom for you and for me as we begin this day. Because if you're going to get a plan, you've you got to have the right plan. You can have, there's all kinds of plans out there. And there are plans that are based upon things that are not based upon what we believe from the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Scriptures that God has given to us in the Bible. Literally, we believe if you knew how to apply this book to your life and you and I can spend the rest of our lives choosing to do that, then we will live according to God's plan. His Word becomes a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And so today we're going to learn and talk as we conclude this series in the Daniel plan about how God wants to speak very clearly to us. If you recall, Daniel is uh, one of the Israelites who is taken captive by the people that are in Babylon that become powerful in that day, God allows His people to be exiled. They're taken uh, from literally from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all the way up to, to Babylon. It, it basically, you want to think about how far that was. And, and they were walking, y'all. They weren't flying or driving. It's basically like from Wilmington to Memphis, 700 miles away. And they're killed captivity. And Daniel chooses, instead of doing the things as people as part of that culture are doing, like eating their food, he chooses to eat what is healthy. Instead of choosing not to pray to anybody but the one God, he prays to the one God. By helping people with the way that they interpret their dreams and helping them to understand that there is a plan and a dream for their lives, Daniel had a plan, and God gave us a plan in this Daniel plan study that we've been involved in. So as you get a plan, you need to understand that God is the only audience that you and I have to please. As a matter of fact, if you live today from the beginning and understand this, if you leave today with only this thought, is that God plus you makes a majority and that you only have to please an audience of one. Say this with me. I only have to please an audience of one. So before we get started and dive into the the message time today, um, I want to introduce you to a friend, and we're going to tell you about a project that I'm helping to literally trying to move my feet to help him get accomplished. Uh, eight, nine months ago, I get this random email, and I very rarely pay attention to random emails in my, my box because, you know, just everybody in the world is, is all about something. But there's something that resonated, something spiritual that said to me, you need to answer this and you need to meet this guy. And so I want to introduce to you my new friend. Um, as a matter of fact, we said backstage we've known each other for eight months, but it seems like we've known each other for eight years or longer. Jonathan Feldstein, who is an Orthodox Jew who lives in, in Jerusalem, but he's from America. He has migrated back to the home country, and uh, we're going to talk to you about a project that we're working on together. So welcome again, my friend. It's great to be here. Good morning, everybody. Everybody, uh, show, show Jonathan some love. Say, hey, Jonathan, we love you. That's love good. you back. See, they would have said that anyway. But that, anyway, so it's great to have you with us again. It's great to be here. So Jonathan is running, working on this project called the Run for Zion, and it certainly attracted me because I like to move my feet and try to run and to, to compete and things like that. And so I said, I'm going to pay attention to this. And literally the very day that we recorded some things live with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Jonathan and I were meeting back in the back, and he was telling me about the Run for Zion. So one of the things that I want you to know about Jonathan is that 
While Jonathan is an Orthodox Jew, he has spent his entire life, and because he's an Orthodox Jew, to connect Jewish people and Christians and Muslims together as well. And I've seen him do this in very specific ways, not just theoretically, but very practically. Um, we're standing in the hotel in, in Orlando at the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast, and Stephen Curry, who's also a friend of his, if you ever watch stuff like TBN and Christian World News, you see Jonathan, you see Stephen Curry, and I saw, here's an Arab Christian, an Orthodox Jew from Newark, and now he lives in Israel, and uh, just an old rock and rolly, bangy, bangy Christian, me. <laughs> and we're all hanging out together and loving, loving God because of the way God made us. So, Jonathan, tell us about your vision and your goal for Run for Zion and what we're trying to get accomplished there. Sure. So God called me years ago to be, as a Jew, a bridge between Jews and Christians and, and to bring Christians to connect to Israel and Jews and Christians to one another. And that's, as you, as you said, um, it's been my life goal. It's been something that has been my uh, part of my vocation, but is very much my avocation. And a little over two years ago, God put on my heart the idea that we, as, as Israeli Jews, have a responsibility to represent Israel, not just as a Jewish country. Of course it is. God returned us, spoke about Daniel, who was exiled, and now we're back. And 70 years later, have built this tremendous country with so much more to do. But we have a responsibility to make it relatable to you, to Christians, to Christians out there all over the world, yeah. and, and, and give you a more positive faith, more positive, not that it's not already, but a faith-deepening experience. And so, so God put on my heart this, what I thought was a really simple idea, to connect Christians through running, through the Jerusalem Marathon, and then we're going to promote the Galilee Marathon and the Tel Aviv Marathon. There's one called the Biblical Marathon that runs through the, the hills of Samaria. That's going to be a challenging one for you. The wow. first 23 miles are all uphill. Oh, <laughs> I'm not running in that okay. one, well, at oh, least not practice. this year. <laughs> so what we've done is we're promoting Run for Zion. It's at runforzion.com, and we're giving Christians a unique opportunity to connect with Israel by running, running a full marathon, Marathon, half marathon, 10K, walking, or just being part of our cheering section. And because God promises in Genesis 12, 3, that he will bless those who bless Israel, so we're giving everyone the opportunity to participate in blessing Israel through the crowdfunding, uh, through our crowdfunding platform. No one has to do it, but we're giving everyone that opportunity. And then, because we want to be part of that blessing, we're giving back a blessing to those who raise enough money. And Pastor Ray, you were one of the first who did that. And I have to tell you, it was one of the most exciting days in my life. Literally, that's not rhetoric. Literally, when I paid for your plane ticket. <laughs> it was awesome. amazing for me to do that, <laughs> to be you. able to say, hey, you've blessed Israel. Here's part of that blessing back. Well, and it's very exciting. So this year, Pastor Ray's representing you. Next year, I hope to see lots of you joining us along, along with him. Absolutely. So Fortunately, there's a person and a couple in our church that said that we want to help make this possible, and so the sponsorship platform was finished that way. But if you want to give, there, there's a way to do that. Now, we're, we're actually, we receive an offering at the end of the service, and that's not really allocated specifically to that. Here's the easiest way to do it. If you want to help, and specifically, Johnson's going to tell you in just a moment more specifically, what are some of the things that this money goes to help the Jewish people inside their homeland and even those that are coming from the exile back to the homeland? But um, just go to, here's all you got to do. Get your smartphone out on the church bar. Type in Ray Hardy. That's with two E's, like Ray of Sunshine, Hardy like a hamburger. And uh, put Run for Zion, and it pulls down the, the page. And, and literally, Jonathan's got a surprise for you. He's going to give to you, to put you an opportunity to win something because you give. Right. So I brought this gift from, uh, with me this week from Israel to Shofar. You're familiar with it, of course. It's been used biblically. So I brought this as a gift. I'm leaving it behind. And so between now and when Pastor Ray comes back from Jerusalem, everyone who donates, whether it's a dollar or a hundred dollars, we've already resolved if you donate a million dollars, you get one automatically. <laughs> yeah. uh, but if you donate, silver and gray, silver and gray that would be beautiful, I promise. But, it, but it, anyone who donates will be entered into a drawing. And, I'm, and on my behalf, I'm going to leave this with Pastor Ray today, and he's going to give it to one of you, somebody who makes a donation to sow, sow in and bless Israel and the things we're going to be supporting. And I know I'm leaving some things off the list. We talked about the return of the exiles. So right now, we're in the last uh, final years of bringing home the uh, ancient Jewish community of Ethiopia. So they're in the process of coming home. In fact, another plane load arrives this week. Um, that's awesome. And feeding hungry people, because unfortunately we have poor people 
in Israel just like everywhere else, and there are orphans and at-risk youth that we're blessing, and widows, and Holocaust survivors, and terror victims, and I know I'm forgetting a couple of them. Mm-hmm. Oh, but, but it's actually important because you mentioned it and mentioned Stephen Corey, mm-hmm. who's my friend, who's a pastor, who's my neighbor. He lives in Bethlehem. I live just south of Bethlehem. I want to sow into his ministry. I want to help him share, share God with, with um, his Muslim neighbors. It's not my job, it's his job, but he's doing an amazing job at it. So my heart is to sow in and help him and help Christian communities uh, throughout the land as well. And you do that. I've just enjoyed my friendship so far and can't wait to, I want you to blow not just the so far, the shofar. This is what this is. So if you ever remember the story about Joshua and the children of Israel, they're marching around Jericho and it says there comes this time where the horns are blown. This is what they look like. So would you blow right. it for us? This is a, so when Joshua did it, the walls fell down. When we do it here, we're building bridges together. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Awesome. Come say hi after the service. I love to get to know you and fellowship together. Yeah, yeah. Please stick around after the service. I want to pray for him before... Um, he leaves the, the stage, though, because he's going to be in the States for a month. Literally, he has six children at home, a grandchild, a son-in-law, son-in-law. and a wife, <laughs> uh, obviously, and they're, he's going to be traveling all the States. And we're going to pray that they, we raise at least $100,000 um, for Run for Zion. We've already raised at least 5100 on my platform, um, and so I want to challenge you to pray as you think about what he's doing. He's interacting with Christians and Jews around the country to help make sure that this dream comes to life. Father, we do pray for Jonathan. Thank you, Lord, for the, the friendship you've given to us as brothers. Um, thank you, Father, for the miracle of technology to connect us together. We ask, Father, that you give him health and you give him wealth, you give him favor, and that you would allow him to raise at least $100,000, if not three or four or $500,000. And help. thank you for letting us be a small part of that. And we ask now that you bless him as he goes. Give him favor in his travels, protect his family, and provide for him. And thank you for letting us show your love to your people in this practical way. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, brother. Thank you so much. Y'all give it up for Jonathan. So how do you get a plan? We've been talking about that all throughout the, the first part of January and the first part of February. How in the world is it that we live out a brand new plan? It begins by understanding how, how God made you uniquely. You know, when you hear a voice in your life that says, you're a loser, you don't make it, you never made it, you don't measure up, if you were prettier, if you were taller, if you were skinnier, if you were happier, if you were smarter, that is not the voice of the God of this universe who made you. The God of this universe, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who made you and the God who made me, the God who sent his son to redeem us and to buy us back, has said something very different about you. So when you hear the voice kind of like, you're just not measuring up, you're not very good, you're bad, you need to do better. More often than not, that is the voice of the devil. And you need to learn to talk back to him and say, God doesn't say that about me. As a matter of fact, when I think about God, if you, on a scale of 0 to 10, if 0 means that you have a big L on your head or whatever, and some people want to give that to you, God's made you all a 10 in some way. I want you just to say this. Say, I'm a 10. Turn to somebody beside you. Say, Pastor said, I'm a 10. Now, so you're over there taking notes. No, you're not. You're not pretty enough. Awesome. Now, the devil's speaking through you. Don't be doing that. So we believe that God has made you a 10. As a matter of fact, years ago, there was a movie made where uh, this lady named Bo Derek, was, the name of the movie was 10. And so as a visual illustration this morning, would you go ahead and hit that first slide and we'll see Bo Derek running down the beach? No, we're not doing that. I'm just kidding. You're getting kind of nervous. Some of you ladies out there, only if they get to see the rock running down the beach at the same time, right? Okay. It's not about how you look. It's about what's inside. Now, thank God, all of you, literally, I can look around this room and honestly say 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 on the outside. But God has made you uniquely you. Nobody has your hair, your eyes, your shape, your personality. Nobody is exactly like you. 
And every single day, we live in this miracle of a human body that, that God created, and he, he breathed into Adam a very soul, a soul. And since then, he's created all of us with a soul that belongs to him. The thing about our bodies, the reason we spend so much time at the first part of the year thinking about our bodies is because we know we need to take better care of them. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But here's the first thing I want you to see today from the psalmist who says to God, like you can say to God, I want you to say this scripture out loud with me. We're going to put it up here on the screen. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Now, you just said that like church people, not like you believed it. All right, is there anybody sitting close to you that you love? If you don't love them yet, don't do this because this is creepy if you do that, all right? But if there is somebody that you're sitting next to, turn to them and say, thank you for making them so wonderfully complex. How about that? Now, guys, I just probably helped you. You need a little post-Valentine's boost there, right? God wants us to understand he's made us wonderfully complex. It never occurred to me before I started running for World Vision and some other causes I have in the past that can I use a skill that you've given me to help draw awareness and draw people back to God? Yeah, it's something as simple as running a race and raising money to bless people I probably will never even meet and to help. God wants to do the very same thing through you. You don't have to run. You don't have to walk. But God wants to uniquely touch and impact this world through you. But that means you got to have a plan. The author of Ecclesiastes, we believe him to be Solomon, um, and he wrote this words years ago. A person who fears God deals responsibly with all of reality, not just a piece of it. You know the pieces of reality that we like to deal with? The pieces that are complementary to us. If, if we have something good in our life, that's just real. But we need to look at all of the reality of our lives. And there are five factors in this life that identifies. As a matter of fact, if you hold your hand up, you can count these, and they all begin with a C, so you can remember them as well. By the way, if you're new to us today, inside of our app, if you download our app, there are notes that you can take with you all the time. There are also notes inside your worship guide if you want to follow along, because what we've got to say is really, really important. Somebody said years and years ago, life is like a hand of poker. you got to play the hand you're dealt. So whether you're playing poker or you're playing go fish, or you're playing 21, you got to play the hand that you're dealt. And so what is in your hand? What are, what are those five factors? First of all, my chemistry and your chemistry. You write it down. My chemistry is part of the hand by which I was dealt. No, nobody can change you. Nobody can make you. As a matter of fact, you had nothing to do with your DNA. But here is what's going to happen inside of your miraculous body through chemistry over the next 24 hours. Your heart's going to beat 103,689 times. Your blood's going to travel 168,000 miles in your body in 24 hours, back and forth from the most efficient pump ever created by engineer, any engineer in all of history. You're going to use only 7 million of your estimated 9 billion brain cells. Some of you will use less. <laughs> you're going to use only, you're going to eat three and a half pounds of food. Some of you are going to eat more. But in the next 24 hours, you're going to decide to make a decision. And I love what Mark Twain said years ago. He says, even if you're on the right track, you're going to get run over if you just sit there. So don't sit there. Don't stay stuck. Do something to get up out of stuck because God's made you a 10. Second, my connections. Not just my chemistry, but my connections. The people that are in your life, the people that are in what my pop used to call the, your sphere of influence, the people you work with, the people you live next door to, the people you go to school with. Those are your connections, your, your family. You're going, oh, don't remind me. <laughs> hey, no, listen, you, my family is so dysfunctional. I hear you saying out there, guess what? All of us that are inside of here, if you're over 21, you're an adult child of a dysfunctional parent, no matter how good they were. Third, my circumstances. My circumstances. Literally, circumstances are, are the things that circle us. They surround us. They're the things in our lives. That, that's that's how, how much we make and where we work and where we live and what kind of grades we've made and what kind of choices we've made in the past and what we put in our body, what we don't no longer put in our body, what we put on our body. The things that, that are there for us, the circumstances in our lives, 
What do we choose to do with the circumstances? Are the circumstances going to conquer us? Or are we going to understand the circumstances as part of what God has given to us to help us to conquer the mission He has given to us in our lives? Fourth is my consciousness. What are you paying attention to? In the field of positive psychology, the most popular course at Harvard University right now is the happiness course. Because so many people are so very unhappy. Not just there, but right in here. My consciousness, am I paying attention? And literally what they're saying is we need to learn to pay attention and be mindful. And, and this right here can, can make us be very unmindful. And this right here can make us very unmindful. That we stop paying attention to the people we're in the room with. Be in the room. Be conscious and pay attention. And look and be sensitive to others. My consciousness is, is part of what identifies me. And then finally, my choices. My choices. The truth is that you can affect the choices of other people, but you can only make your own. You can affect the choices of other people, but you can only make your own. So choose wisely. You remember the, the, the scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark? If we had time, we played for you, but we don't have time today. Where somebody chooses well, and he says, he has chosen well. And then the other one, he has chosen poorly. When he gets vaporized into all kinds of pieces of dirt or whatever they made that character to be in. So, so what are five choices that I can make that help me to get a better plan? It's what I call God's high five. Number one, I can choose to be healthier. I can choose to be healthier. The psalmist wrote these words, You made my body, Lord. Now give me sense to heed your laws. You can choose to make a healthier choice. I can choose to make a healthier choice. We can choose to make healthier choices as a body. And let me just stop and pause for just a minute. Thank you for caring about people like Jonathan and people like we're going to learn about Matthew and Courtney because God loves Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus. He has sent us in Jesus' name to love this world, Christ followers. Let's do it. But it means I've got to make healthy choices in my life. I've got to choose to make healthier choices in my life. I need to eat better. Let me tell you a couple of things that can actually help you very specifically help you eat better. This is just, if God made it, eat it. <laughs> Second, the shortest distance between the field to the table means it's going to be better for you. Somehow, Krispy Kreme donuts has to fit in there somewhere. But no, literally, the shortest distance, whether it is meat that we're eating or vegetables we're eating or, or whatever, the shortest distance from the field to the table is most healthy for us. Here's another thing. This is bonus material for those of y'all in this service. Write it before you bite it or write it when you bite it. What does that mean? Keep a record of what you're eating. If you go, that 300-calorie Krispy Kreme donut is 300 calories, it, there's literally apps that are out there. Let me recommend one to you specifically. It's called My Fitness Pal. Under Armour does it. You can download it for free on your, on your phone. And literally, when you start typing in stuff, it tells you how much the Krispy Kreme donut is, how much the chicken platter is at, at Applebee's, and all that kind of stuff, even though I think that's gone from here or whatever now. Write it before you bite it. Write it when you bite it. Shorter, shorter distance between the table to the field before you put it on your fork means it's better. Drink more water. <laughs> Get more sleep. Scientists say you need seven to eight hours sleep. I don't really need much sleep. I only need three to four hours. Yeah, everybody else around you the next day needs you to have had more sleep. <laughs> Take it from me. Interestingly enough, your body actually holds on to fat if you don't get enough sleep. One of the very best things you can do is to get sleep. There's a thing in your body called leptin, and your body holds on to it, thinking, oh, gosh, they're never going to let me sleep. I'm going to have to have some more energy to burn. So go to sleep. Second, I could choose to deepen my relationships. I can choose to live healthy. I can choose to deepen my relationships. How? By making love my priority. By making loving other people my priority. Let love be your highest goal, Paul writes to the church at Corinth in Greece in the first century. He writes to the church at Ephesus, I pray that Christ will live in your hearts by faith and that your life will be strong in love and be built on love. One thing we take with us when we die and we take our last breath, how much we love God and how much we love others, everything else is going to disappear. And then I can make love my first priority by loving the fear away. 
John, one of Jesus' followers who followed him around for three years more or less, said, there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. Hey, you want to do something really random when you're scared of somebody or you're scared of something? Say, God, help me to love and turn this situation around. When you want to hit somebody, what if you put your arm around them? They're going to try to hit you back. You kind of say, no, man, it's all about love. We're going to make this right. We're going to fix this. This week I had an opportunity with a couple people I love that were kind of at odds with one another. And they kind of ran into each other, and they weren't expecting to run into each other. And, and I happened to be standing there when it happened, and they both were kind of at odds with one another. And I said, while we're standing here, And it melted the tension. And it caused hatred to pass away. Third, I can choose to trust God no matter what happens. He really is trustworthy. Whether we live or whether we die, He is always with us. The moment, the day we take our last breath, immediately for those of us who have chosen to follow Him, we will be taken into eternity. We will belong to Him forever. I can choose to trust God no matter what happens. Listen to this. God knows us far better than we know ourselves. Isn't that freeing? And it frees you or makes you scared to death. Oh, my gosh, God knows. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original intended shape of our lives there in him. He already knows. He's working the chemistry and the circumstances and the connections and the consciousness. He's working those things together for you. But most of all, I believe he's working in your choices and my choices. Get a plan, all you tens. Get a plan. So we can say with the psalmist, I will praise God. I will praise the Lord no matter what happens. I'm going to praise him because something's going to happen in the middle of this that I don't understand right now. Somebody's going to help me to change this flat tire. Somebody's going to help me to manage my money. Somebody's going to help me to get employed. Somebody's going to help me to be a better parent. Somebody's going to help me to be a better spouse. I'm going to in some way become better because this has happened to me in my life. Next, number four, I can choose what I think about. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you by changing the way you think. What channel you click on, what site you go to, what things you put in your ears to listen to, what you focus upon. You choose what you want to think about. I cannot, I cannot. Yes, yes, you do, and, and God can help you to think better. Whatever is true, whatever is powerful, whatever is pure, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. The Panthers need your help. Lord, we think they're going to be better next year. No, but seriously, think about your life. Abraham Lincoln said these words. He said, a man or a woman is about as happy as they want to be. That coming from somebody who probably struggled with manic depression or bipolar depression, according to those people that are his biographers. And then finally, cho choice number five. It's the final choice here, but it's the first choice that I want to challenge you to take today. I can choose to believe in Jesus Christ. A lot of these things are available to everybody. But the supernatural po power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead is available to you. Is your Christ follower? When someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. She becomes a brand new person inside. The old things have passed away. A new life has begun. So today, as we draw this time of worshiping together to a conclusion, is a new life begun in your life? Or are you renewing your life around these five choices? So here's the bottom line today. Here's the so what and the now what. If it is to be, it is partly up to me. The choice is mine. Am I going to choose to follow the way and the truth and the life, or am I going to choose and follow every other way but that way? 
And the other thing is my choices are mine. Your mama can't choose for you. Your daddy can't choose for you. Your wife or your husband can't choose for you. Your best friend can't choose for you. Your children can't choose for you. You can't choose for your grandchildren. Although I like to make choices for them all the time. God loves you, Easton and Ella, and have a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> Do what I say. But God doesn't have any grandchildren. He has only children. And I want to offer you the opportunity to rededicate your life plan to Him or to dedicate it for the very first time. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for those that are with us today. Thank you for braving the rain and the flu and the stomach junk and all the other stuff that's going around. They have chosen to honor you, God. Now, I pray that they have heard you speak in their hearts to inspire them to take that hand that's been dealt to them and to play their own hand with better choices. So right now, we want to make this decision, Father. If there's one here today who, who knows Christ and you name the name of Christ and, and you want to, to choose to follow Him, you've chosen to follow Him long ago, but, but you know that you have swerved off course and now you need to dial back on course right now, you can say, God, I dedicate, I rededicate myself in my life to Jesus Christ, would you just right now where you are, if that's the prayer of your heart, I'm rededicating my life today. Just shoot your hand up like you got the answer in the classroom. God bless you. I see your hand up here. I see you back in the back. There's, there's a few. There's over here. Over here. God bless you. Are there others? And then there are those that are here today that, that you've said you've heard about Jesus, but you've never said yes to Jesus. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son in this world to condemn you, but to save you. And right now where you sit, you can say, Father, I'm leaving my life behind just as I know it, or I'm building upon what it is you've done in my life. Please forgive me. Help me to follow you as Savior and Lord. Please save me through the shed blood redeemed for me on the cross by Jesus Christ. I'm just going to ask you, I'm I'm not going to count, I'm just going to ask you just to shoot your hand up around the room. I want to welcome you to God's kingdom. If that's your prayer today, that God's saying saying this to you. Thank you, God bless you, sir. I see your hand in the back. Are there others that are saying yes to him? I see you, ma'am. Thank you, God bless you. I see you. Thank you, God bless you, sweetheart. Father, for these who have said yes to you for the first time today, and those that have said yes to you again by saying they want to give you all of them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we we thank God that not only have we demonstrated publicly that people have been baptized today, but there there are at least three other people in this room who have said yes to Christ today. We're grateful for that. Challenge you to do two things. Turn to somebody that you're, you came with or tell somebody that you know today, I made that decision. Whether you're rededicating or you're giving life to Christ. Second, if you are a first-time Christ follower, would you please make sure to stop by the welcome station and say, hey, I made that decision today. Pastor Ray told me to come by here. Um, you can also record this if you're watching online on your app. And uh, if you'll give us some information like on Facebook or something where we can reach out to you, we'll promise to send you materials and we're going to be praying for you as well.